Hey guys, what's up? I'm Aru. NPCs, the simple design character that looks like every other stock asset in the game. The walking piles of code that were honestly just supposed to beat up for random materials or to have skippable dialogue that's not really made to shine in the spotlight. NPCs in games have always served the same purpose, to fill up a role that's more so just made to move the story or transition to the main characters of the game. But sometimes, NPCs end up shining far brighter than any of the main cast, either due to an impactful or relatable story that hooks the players to them emotionally or by some enjoyable situation that really entertains them to the point that they keep wanting them to come back. And sometimes even unvoiced characters from mere side quests end up getting more attention for their unique personalities, to the point that they come back as characters from an event and sometimes as part of the main character's story. This video is about a character that made his way from being a simple voiceless enemy NPC that sneaked his way into being both friends and enemies with the player within the game. This guy didn't start off as the main antagonist that wants to destroy the world, or a person with a sad backstory that made him into a cruel villain. This guy is a mere bookworm that just wants to study the history of the world, a pawn to be disposed of and replaced when he dies, a non-essential NPC that for some reason caught the attention of players in the most unlikely possible way, and then later became one of the most memorable NPCs within the Genshin community, Enjo, the abyss lector that just wants to get by and be left to his own devices. Granted, he's not the coolest and most enigmatic character in the game, he makes up for it in more ways than one and in the most entertaining but also quite interesting ways. So join me as we gush over my favorite character in the game along with your own favorites, giving them a spotlight and the possibility to come back in the game as more than just NPCs. Now then, let's get started. If you were one of the players that started in the early years of Genshin Impact, then you'll most likely remember when Enkanomiya was first released, a region located underneath Inazuma that existed thousands of years ago. And this is where we meet Enjo, an unvoiced bookworm that helped guide us through the various puzzles and the main world quests of Enkanomiya in unlocking the baptismal bishop boss. Enjo introduces himself as a clerical staff that would help with these ceremonies and guide you through the underground region. His dialogues were very energetic and spontaneous and emphasized his character right from the get-go. This includes a ton of jokes and the fact that he was actually helping us throughout the majority of the quest. He also interestingly guides us through various items and histories that only the people of Sangonomiya would know about. Up until we reached and fixed the Dainichi Mikoshi Tower, we met with the actual clerical staff of Enkanomiya, Aru. Uh, not me, this guy. Aru mentions that Enjo was displeased with the Dainichi Mikoshi and that Enjo didn't find whatever he was looking for here. But shortly after we defeated the baptismal bishops, he shows up and reveals a glimpse of Enkanomiya's ancient civilization, which isn't completely true. After our fight, he starts to beg for his life and calls for surrender and reveals information about the Abyss as well as some interesting assumptions about Paimon. He then ups and leaves and basically that's the end of the quest. Now something interesting here about Enjo is that he doesn't act like the other Abyss dwellers. He's much more diplomatic in a sense and he's more interested in talking rather than plain fighting. And he's more interested in talking rather than just taking whatever he wants and fighting for whatever he needs. He calls himself a clerk despite being a lector and disappears with the promise of meeting again. Now this was his first interaction with the Traveler and I think that the way he speaks through mere dialogue and the exchange we've had with him made enough of an impact as a character who thought that Paimon would betray us and the person who helped reveal lore about the old civilization. Now this makes him his own character that did not die and helped shed some light on the story of the world through his own niche, allowing not only a return of his character but also leaving enough room for intrigue in what exactly he meant with the lore drop that he gives, along with his mildly entertaining personality despite not being voiced at the time. The second time we meet Enjo is during the gateway offering event in Enkanomiya. And this time he's a voiced event character who was messing with the bishops of Enkanomiya and is also the cause of Watatsumi's spirit ritual to be put on hold. The voice acting for Enjo, I have to say really gave him the character and life that his initial voiceless character deserves and honestly exceeds the expectation from a mere NPC. He's technically an evil lector from the Abyss, but acts more like a member from Team Rocket that just wants to mess with the Traveler while also doing his own thing and not be part of the main story. And this again changes once we meet him in Natlan three regions after. Now this is one of the examples of how the game moves along even when we don't see what other people are doing and don't just appear out of nowhere for the sake of linking certain things with the current patch. Granted, he is part of the Abyss so that's a plus for him for being part of the main antagonist sides in the first place. 
Jedi's. But he explains it yet again that he's just a marginal figure of the Order and prefers delving in the more inconsequential aspects of the world and, dare I say, the story. But at this point, he's already gained more attention for being a quirky abyss lector minding his own business than the majority of lectors that we've met in the more serious story quests and world quests. And if you think about it, he's actually doing quite a lot more than he lets on. Enjo was the mastermind behind messing with Enkanomiya's flow of abyss and elemental energy as well as tricking the bishops and having Enkanomiya be shrouded in darkness that is the abyss. Which was a different and deadlier and intoxicating darkness that the bishops didn't exactly want. This then leads us to a fight with Enjo who was quite enthusiastic in having a rematch with us and of course after we beat him he decides to surrender like a coward and we end up with another fun chat with him. In a sense he sort of preserves his seat within the game as a recurring character very much more than other playable characters already, and has possibly made himself into a mainstay character for his huge lore drops as well as his quirky personality as an Abyss Lector. Compared to the more serious and almost zealous members of the Abyss Order, Enjo acts more like the Abyss Order's own Hexen Circle who just minds his own business and messes with, air quotes, inconsequential things. His name Enjo might not even be Enjo at all and we still don't exactly know what his primary goal is. This event that he himself orchestrated is also where we find out about the vassals of Orobashi. This is also where we get to meet Tsumi, a vassal of Watatsumi, who was a sort of half-dragon and half-human serpent servant of Orobashi. Tsumi was supposed to be the one to communicate with the bishops of Enkanomiya, but she and her guardian were attacked and was assumed to have been dead. But she's actually a living vessel today, a half-serpent half-human who protects the bishops and refuses to go up to meet with humans due to her distrust towards humanity. Interestingly, we can also say that Enjo is the first abyss character that was related to anything regarding the bishops, the ancient civilization, and the dragons' origins, which again he shows shows up back in Natlan, a place where dragons and humans live in harmony. Moving on, Sanka was first introduced as a character who was speaking with two kids who lost their Saurian companion to the Abyss and the Night Kingdom. This is also where the few or maybe the only time an unvoiced NPC became part of a main character's quest. At this time, he was basically extracting information from these kids about the historical flame of Natlan, the Turnfire. And he extrapolates the fire into a source of power or an origin of the said Turnfire, which then leads him to a very important part of Natlan's history and the likely main source of the abyss in Natlan, the Mare Jivari. At this point, it's the third time that Enjo comes back as an NPC and is now a part of Kenichi's character quest and is also looking into a main location within Natlan. Now if he at some point becomes part of the Archon quest as someone who guides us through the Merjibari just like he did with Enkanomiya, then I'm more than sure that he's part of some separate abyss group or that maybe he's actually part of the Five Sinners which I'll talk about later. His knowledge of the abyss and the Night Kingdom is also something worth noting since he actually saves the abyss inflicted Saurian and pulls her out of the Night Kingdom by using air quotes bungee jumping, which if you paid attention to the Archon quest is actually how you pull ancient names out of the Night Kingdom, which could mean that everything as long as it's in the Night Kingdom can be pulled and saved. But then again, only Enjo knows how to do that. Before I start gushing and make a theory that's solely about Enjo, I want to talk about other NPCs in Genshin that have a similar effect that Enjo has made. I'm sticking with world quest characters or unvoiced ones since I think that characters within events and main stories have made their own impact as characters that can simply return during their respective related events. Characters like Alice, Dunyarzad, or maybe even Madame Ping, I think have made themselves into mainstay characters in the game already. With more hope for Dunyarzad to show up again in Sumeru related events like the Sub Zero's Festival, which comes in the current 5.1 patch. What I want to shed more light on are the characters like Jet and Ru, or the Aranara, and maybe even the Adepti like Ling Yuan and Fujin. These NPCs that we've spoken to in World Quest still have a chance at returning during events within the game. They don't necessarily need to be embedded into the story just like Enjo has, but they at least should have a quick part within some of the events in their respective regions, giving them voice lines that can return every now and again to give life to the game outside of another new NPC that might end up being unremembered from the event. But that's not to say that event NPCs can't be remembered. NPCs like Jet can be a voiced character as part of the Sub-Zeros festival as maybe a hireling along with Dea. 
instead of inserting XYZ new NPC. Tsumi can come back in another event where she finally meets with Kokomi and be the connection between bishops and humans in Watatsumi. Meanwhile, Fujin and Ling Yuan can come back during the Lantern Rite, which is technically part of Chen Yu Vale's tradition as a region that joined Liwe. In the same way, Gaming was introduced in the latest Lantern Rite, maybe we can have Fujin and Ling Yuan meet with the people that they protect. Lastly, Ru can make a reappearance in Inazuma's summer festivals, maybe interacting with the other ghosts in the recent Inazuma ghost events. The Aranara can also make a short appearance in the Sub-Zero's festival, along with the Pari as part of maybe a kid quest, since only children can see them due to their minds being still free if I could remember. Prince Sila can meet with Nuvolet at some point, or Risley can finally use that boat of his that was never really seen again after the flood. Even short cameo interactions can increase the vibe and liveliness of the game since these NPCs are already characters that players have enjoyed seeing and have interacted with at length already as unvoiced characters. We already know about the two Fatui agents in Liwe who always end up dating in the Lantern Rite, but why can't we see these other world characters have a short cameo within their respective cities? Letting them speak for even at least two or three lines is honestly going to send players through the roof already and even more invested in the game's world building if they're part of an event quest every other patch, and it can even make more incentive for them to end up as playable characters in the future. They're already fleshed out with their own backstory, and making them playable just like how Cloud Retainer ended up, I think would be a step in the right direction for more cohesion in the game's world. You won't need to make a character and make them work with the story if the character itself is already part of the world. You only need to link them in a creative way instead of having to start from scratch. And for some, they don't exactly need to be too interconnected. They just need to be interesting enough, and to some extent, they already are. Going back to Enjo real quick before I end the video, I think that there's a reason for Enjo to be a Natlan, and we can find that reason through his two names. Enjo in Enkanomiya and Sanka in Natlan. This is still theoretical, but it has a lot to do with fire and the abyss, and Natlan has a lot of both. Enjo means above the depth, which could mean that he's not exactly part of the Abyss Order, which is where the Five Sinners theory is from. But the word Enjo is also a homophone for the term flaming, which leads us to something flaming above the depths. Sanka means outcast in Japanese, since he's copying an Inazuman NPC. This might mean that Enjo is something that represents flaming and an outcast that isn't affected by the intoxication of the Abyss. Now if we go back to the five sinners, Sirta Logi is the closest to something that is flaming and can be considered as something that isn't exactly part of the Abyss Order or the Abyss. Sirta Logi is the flame or fire sword of the fire giant, Sirter. He is also the master of Skirk and has been making experiments using the Narwhal in Fontaine. He is also called the Foul, which is the origin of Foul Legacy. During our interactions in Enkanomiya, he mentions turning into a fire flinging monster as well as getting a rush from burning a library. Now, this simply might just hint at him being a huge arson and that he prefers to look like a pyro lector. His involvement in searching for the turnfire as well as the Merjivari heavily implies this relation of fire as well. Now, if an Abyss Lector really can be allowed to have as much freedom as Enjo does, then there's either a lot of Abyss Lectors in the Abyss Order to be that disposable, which I think is unlikely, because I think that Lectors are quite high in the hierarchy, or that Enjo might be something worse, and is merely pretending to be an Abyss Lector. His knowledge of the Night Kingdom, the Abyss, Enkanomiya, and even Natlan is enough to make him a right hand of the Abyss Ruler but he's not. At least, he says he isn't. But that's just a crack theory that I've made up, just so I can make sense of why Enjo is coming back as an NPC in Kenichi's story. Now, I've rambled on too much about NPCs already, but I think I've said my piece for both Enjo and his rise to character dumb, as well as other characters that deserve the same spotlight within the game. So if you've watched all the way to the end of this video and you enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment below your thoughts on how NPCs can work within Genshin, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification to see more of my videos. As you can notice, I'm quite sick and my nose is full. As I'm editing this video, I still have not done the 5.1 Archon quest, but I'll get to that at some point, okay, don't worry. And I'll be sure to cook up some lore and theory videos as we move on closer to getting Mavika and Jansen as playable characters. I'm not exactly too excited for Capitano, but I'm hoping that the Archon quest would help me pull for him in the future. Now then, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Now, as always, like, comment, and subscribe to the bell for more of my rounds. Blinks and stay mad, theorists. Bye.